Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, session of a TIDES webinar. This is the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. This is our special webinar series where we get to meet scientists from around the world. My name is Bertha Vasquez, and I'm the director of the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. And today we have with us Scott Thompson. Uh, Scott is the curator of the Colonian Research Institute in Florida. He will present his work over the last 25 years on the evolution of the side neck turtles from South America and Australia, including the discovery of the living fossil Elsea labricorum, or golf snapping turtle. The species was described as a fossil from Riversley, Australia, but was later found to be still alive. I think that's really cool. <laughs> he will discuss the combining of the fossil record with that of living species, incorporating DNA technology and cryptic species. We can also discuss zeogeography and the explanations of how a group occurs in two continents on opposite sides of the earth and nowhere else. He is a curator of the Colonian Research Institute, like I told you, but also a research associate at the Museo de Zoologia, Zoologia in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and a research fellow at the University of Canberra in Australia. He has named eight species, a genus and a subgenus of turtles. I don't think I've ever met someone who's done that, so I'm very excited today. This includes both living and fossil species. And as a researcher, he is a tax taxonomist and a paleontologist studying morphology, nomenclature, and statistics. Well, this is great. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for being with us today. I'm going to go ahead and pass the, the mic on to you now, and you can take it away. Great, thank you very much. Um, welcome everybody. Um, hope you guys all enjoy this. I'm going to share my um, presentation and talk over it, which of course, um, oh, whoops, where is it? We have a real international crowd here with us tonight, folks, people from all over the world, including uh, Australia. So I think that's really neat. Okay, can everyone see that? Uh, yes, I think so. Okay, basically, um, the I've been at this a while, and hence the picture of me when I was much younger there. Um, but that particular picture is quite important because what I'm doing there, that specimen is the holotype of that species, which I described in 2006. And that, so that is the original specimen used to describe the, spe the species. And that's a species known as Elsea albagula, or um, the Burnett River snapping turtle from Australia. And um, the other picture on that is um, Elsea lavracorum. That's the first one that was caught by us um, alive after the fossil was um, demonstrated to be the same species as the living form. Okay, as I said, I've described quite a few species. I'm gonna to get to the fossil in a second. And I wanted to show some of the stuff I've described over the years. One of the early ones I described was a turtle called Caledina barangangii. And I know some of the names sound a little strange, but um, these are scientific names. Um, scientific names are the formal names of species. And um, you're familiar with many more of them than you probably think because no dinosaur, for example, has, is even known by anything but a scientific name. So they're not that difficult. But Burrangangi is actually the, Burrangang is the Aboriginal Australian word for that species. So when I named it, I used their name for the species, which would be a bit like using in North America, for example, an Indian name for a species. So when um, you discover a species, you get to give it the name. I get to choose the name, yes. There are rules about how you do that, but I get to basically choose it. Um, after describing that Caledina, I, I also went on and worked on um, a group of turtles called the snapping turtles in Australia. They're not related to American snapping turtles, um, but what I did with them was we had three species in that genus, and um, that's all that was known when I started working. And there's now 11 species in the genus and it's split into three subgenera. Um, so it's a whole cryptic species group that got exploded into multiple species um, when they actually got researched properly. And this is one that I described in 2015. And um, that's also the, the subgenus I named, Hanwera kelly's, which is, um, it's pigeon, 
which is a New Guinea um, language, Hanwera, which means stream, and Kelly's, which is Greek, which means turtle. So basically you combine words together to form names and that's how you do it. And other parts of this genus I also split up. Uh, like I said, I described Alsea albagula and on the left is that turtle. That's a female, a male and a, and a baby of the species. And it's in another subgenus called Pelicomastes. Now, I didn't name that genus, but I resurrected it. It had been forgotten and lost. It was described in 1897. And um, what I did is I realized it was pertaining to all these turtles from Eastern Australia. So I resurrected the name and used it rather than come up with some other new name. And another one I described in 2016 was Elsea flavi ventralis. Um, now, I also started out dealing with the Elsea because that was my master's at the time, back in the late 1990s. Another problem in them was these two species were also known as Elsea's back then. And so the genus I described is Myukeles. Another Aboriginal word, my, Myuna, which means high water, and Kelly's, which means turtle. So combine them and you've got high water turtle. And um, they live in the top areas of streams, and that's why I named it that. That genus got split by somebody else, um, and they named um, the genus Flaviemis, which was one of the species in that group, um, Flaviemis purbosi. Now, this is the sort of work I do. Um, basically, this is me at several museums. Um, on the left and right, I'm at the Colonial Research Institute here in Florida. Um, we are a um, non-profit museum, private museum, but um, we have one of the largest collections of turtles in the world. We have over 18,000 specimens and um, we have specimens representing over 95% of the species of turtles on the planet. And um, in the boxes behind me on the left is um, 46 species of side neck turtle, Keelidae family Keelidae and an alligator snapping turtle that I got photographed with on the right. In the middle at the top um, that's a guy by the name of Jason Schaefer taking the selfie but um, I'm in the background we're working on a new species of Elsea that's um, not been described yet and um, down the bottom one of the things I end up doing a lot and that and the top one is at the Queensland Museum in Australia the bottom one is at the Museum of Victoria in Australia and one thing I end up doing a lot, I've been identifying turtles for the last 30 years and um, working on it fully for the last 25. So whenever I go to a museum, I end up with every drum of turtles they've got and I sit there and identify every turtle they have. And um, so I can spend up to a week at a museum just going through turtle after turtle after turtle putting a name, telling them what it is, because they don't know. People basically drop specimens, um, animals that have died for whatever reason, off to the museum where they get um, preserved, but they often don't know what they are. And so I will go through and identify them all to species so they know what they have, and then they update their databases. And that's literally what I'm doing at that point at the Museum of Victoria. I went through thousands of turtles over the period of a couple of days. Now the Gulf snapping turtle, Elsea labracorum, um, I won't deny it is a an event that probably made a, made my career. I won't deny that it was a um, very interesting and unusual situation. Now Arthur White and Mike Archer actually described the species. I didn't name it, and um, in 1994, and they described it as a fossil that belonged to a genus called Emidura, and um, it was from Riversley in Australia, and um, I got to see the turtle shortly afterwards. Arthur White showed it to me. And for those interested in TED Talks, by the way, you can see Mike Archer. He did a TED Talk on, um, on de-extinction, which is very interesting. But um, as soon as I looked at it, I knew that wasn't an Emidura. So on site, I could tell it wasn't one of those. But what I can tell by sight and what I can prove are not necessarily the two same thing. So I then spent two years proving 
that it wasn't an Imagera and also proving it was still alive, which meant I had to do some serious research because there was no description of characters that would have helped at the time. And I've put drawings up of the fossil rather than photos because drawings are often better than photos when it comes to fossils because um, you've all heard the saying, um, can't see the forest for the trees. Photos just show so much detail that you often lose what's important. Whereas in a drawing, I can just show the important details, but the drawings are done from photos. So they're actually 100% accurate. You can measure the drawings and they're as accurate as measuring the actual fossil. So I looked at characters and these are some of the characters I looked at. And if you look here, this is an area I called the um, anterior bridge strut. I had to develop a nomenclature for um, turtle shells. It wasn't, it hadn't really been done. And you'll see it's in, present in both specimens. This is a modern Elsaia, this is the fossil. And also on the plastron, which is the belly of the turtle, you've got these lines here, which are very similar. So there was a whole series of characters, um, about six in total, that I used to key the fossil and the um, living species out, and they came out the same. And that was how I demonstrated that the living form was the same as the fossil. I also, at the same time, demonstrated it wasn't an Emidura and was actually an Elsaia. Now, this was a fairly massive um, publicity thing the next day after the paper came out. I won't deny that. Um, even Carl Zimmer wrote an article on it um, about the, it got voted into the top 100 science stories of 1996. Carl Zimmer wrote the article on that. Um, and it's a living fossil. So basically a living fossil is a species that is found to be alive after it's been found as a fossil. So as I said earlier, I have things called holotypes, which is the original specimen describing the species. In most species, living species, that's a, a, a specimen of a living turtle. This is a living species whose holotype is a rock. And um, that is extremely rare. It's not very common. There are a few species, and I think she's in the channel somewhere, Jenny Bramall. I think she worked with one of them as well, another one, a mammal. But um, anyway, um, it achieved a lot of publicity. Um, it even su it surprised me. I actually expected it. And I got to a university early the next day at eight o'clock in the morning to find out the dean, who was the only person there, had been taking messages since 6 a.m. So um, this got a lot of notoriety, newspapers all over the world, um, which is great. And like I said, I can't deny that it made a big jump on my career. Um, but it led to a lot more research into the evolution of turtles. And over the next 20 years, I described quite a lot of species because of that. And in turtles, there's only 376 living species. And um, I named eight of them, um, although three of those were fossil species. And, um, but there's a lot more fossils. There's many hundreds of fossil species of turtles. And then fossils actually outnumber the living forms. And that leads to the next issue in fossils. All right, so how are they relevant? This is just three of the fossils I've worked with over the years. Um, the one at the top right, Reodites divisi, I actually described. So it was a new species of fossil I found um, from a collection in Darling Downs. The one below, I didn't name it, but um, its original name was Elsaia, um, well, Calemis uberima. But there were, I synonymized a bunch of species and that let the name Pelicomastes available to be used as a genus. And that's how it came through. And um, I resurrected this species. The one on the left is one from South America and that's Phrynops um, paranaensis, which um, is a very important fossil from um, um, south, uh, southern Brazil in the Paraná region. Uh, this is another fossil that I described, one of the early ones I did. This is an Elsaia um, called Nadi Bajagu. Again, it's an Aboriginal term, um, Nadi Bajagu. It's two words. It means from a long time ago. 
And so I basically, it means ancient turtle. And this is a 2.8 million year old turtle that I described from Queensland. Okay, how is it used? This is what we, this is why we, I'm using the fossils. This is a combination data set and it's a very new one. It's not technically been published yet. But um, what I've done here, the, um, Tree is has been developed from molecular data, but I'm putting fossils into it. And the fossils, which are in red, um, that I've used are some Elsaia and Emadura fossils and Maya Kelly's fossils. And what the fossils do is it allows us to place um, known times into that tree. The tree is basically showing the genetic distance between each of the species down the right hand side, but by inference, that also means how how much time there is between them. And so by placing the fossil in, instead of having an approximation of saying it's this, this one is this much time, but no idea how many years that is, it's just one is bigger than the other. I now can put fossils in, which allow me to put actual dates on some of those lineages. And these are very old. Um, some of the fossils in um, Australia and South America um, are extremely old um, with the chelids and they go back around about um, 130 million years in South America and 106 million years in Australia. So these things are very, very old um, fossil lineages and show that the turtles have been evolving for a long time. And by placing dates, we now know we can now tie it to many, many other things. Yes, 130 million. They get older than that. All right, evolution of characters. What I'm about is evolution of turtles. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to stop the sharing for one sec because I want to show you something about the turtle shell. Okay, I'm actually going to use a shell so you can actually see it. This is a Kelodyna, which is a snake neck turtle. Um, hopefully you can see it. All right. This is a fossil. Uh, this is not a fossil. This is from a living animal. And basically that's the shell of a snake neck turtle. Now the, the plastron, which is the belly, comes off once you've got all the scoots off. And you can see the inside. And the turtle shell is quite an amazing piece of evolution, but there's nothing novel about it. It is just a, an amazing modification of the rib cage. If you look at it closely down the center, that's where the vertebrae are. They are part of the shell. So the turtle can't jump out of its shell. It's not possible. All of these are ribs. And this is a young animal that has fontanelles still in the shell. These close up as they get older. So you can actually see what's known as the rib gomphosis, which is the edge of the rib in each one. It has the same number of ribs as a number of vertebrates. And so basically the turtle shell is nothing but a, an extremely modified rib cage. One of the interesting things is they have their ribs on the outside of their pelvis. If you feel your back, you've got a um, shoulder blade there, so your anterior pelvis, your, your shoulder complex, is on the outside of your rib cage. With turtles, they are on the inside, and they're the only vertebrate to do that. It's unique. But in the end, as weird as the um, turtle shell looks, it is, in the end, just a rib cage. And it is used for armor, made the turtles. So we'll put him down. And I'll go back to the screen share. You know, I always tell my students, Dr. Thompson, that nature doesn't like completely make something new. It just modifies what it has. Absolutely. It's a variation on a theme, so to speak. Yep. And all vertebrates have more or less the same theme, no matter how strange they look. Um, they are all basically quadrupeds. Um, they're all basically got rib cage, vertebrate, vertebral column, skull at the front, tail at the back. Even us humans, um, we've modified it. Yes, we are now bipedal, but we it is still the basic same framework. And we all have five fingers. We're tetra 
tetradactyl. And um, anyway, on the screen is some ancient turtles, very ancient. And the top one that is a genuine true turtle is the one called Papakelis, which goes back over 200 million years. Um, so the interesting thing with the turtles is these things have survived two mass extinctions. They have been around for um, over 240 million years at least. And um, the two mass extinctions they survived was the one at the end of the Triassic and the one at the end of the Cretaceous. So they didn't just watch dinosaurs go extinct, they watched them evolve from nothing, um, from the reptiles that were around beforehand. So they've been through all of that. And um, turtles are very old and um, they've been around a long time and I think they'll probably get through the next, next mass, mass extinction too. I, they can go very long periods of time without food and water and um, they have very slow metabolisms so they can just do their thing slowly. Um, all right, so this is leading into evolution, which is kind of what I study. I'm, I'm studying the evolution of turtles, how they evolved. And these are three very interesting turtles in the family Chelidae. You may be familiar with snake necks. Um, these are the ones called snake necks. So you've got three genera, or that's the plural of genus. So you've got Chelidina from Australia, and you've got Hydromedusa and Chelis from South America. Um, they're actually not that closely related to each other, even though they look like each other. And what you do is you develop a tree, which you may use molecular data for and morphology preferably, but then you can take individual characters and rework them into the tree to see the direction of the evolution. So what we're looking at is what we call the polarity of the evolution. Now this is um, examples of the different long necks. These are their neck vertebrae. It's the last four vertebrae in the neck um, of each of those species. There's two chelidine, three chelidinas there representing the three different subgenera of chelidina, plus a hydromedusa, plus a chelis. Um, the chelis is the matter matter, for those who don't know. The hydromedusa is um, the Brazilian snake neck turtle, and the chelidinas are um, Australian snake neck turtles. I've, what I've done to the picture is each row of vertebrae, they're not to scale. I've done that deliberately so that they all look about the same size, even though the matter matter, for example, is an extremely big turtle, whereas um, the top one is, a, is actually a fairly small turtle. And um, what you can see in these is what I'm looking at is the evolution of the neck. Because these have a long neck and most turtles don't. But interestingly, um, they've evolved it slightly differently depending on um, what they are. If you see, you can see small character differences in each of the um, vertebrae. So these ones, they come straight out perpendicular. The, the others are all bent backwards. The, these are the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae is what they're called. Um, in the Caledina um, cani, these are actually very blade-like and small, whereas in the expanser, they're much thicker because they've got much more muscle attachment. And um, so what I do is I map all of this into the, um, into the tree that it was developed from, and then I can look at the direction of the characters. Now, one of the problems that's occurred in, um, I'll go into that one in a minute. All right, one of the problems that has occurred in looking at the tree for the chelids is that there is a big mismatch between molecular data and morphology. The morphology tends to show that all these snake necks are related and tries to always build the tree with them clustering together which makes a real mess of all the ones with short necks. The molecular data, which I'll show you the tree of them later, um, has them split so that you've got a whole group of turtles in South America and a whole group of turtles in Australia and they have what is called reciprocal monophyly, which I'll show in a minute. But one of the main reasons for that, and one of the things I've been working on most recently, is to look at the evolution of that 
And the problem is in a tree, when you're doing the morphological tree or the molecular tree to a lesser degree, is it really matters where you root the tree, what is called um, the outgroup. And many people who have been doing this work have been using um, a group called the Pelamedusids, which are the South American river turtles, um, as the outgroup. And that doesn't work. And that's the problem because they're a short neck. And the sister, um, the sister group of the side neck turtles of the family Chelidae is actually a group called the Arerapemidae, which are completely extinct. And um, there are no living forms, but they're a snake neck turtle. And what it looks like is that the long neck condition in the Chelids is the primitive condition. And all the short necks have evolved from long necks. And when you reroute the tree that way, it actually lines up with the molecular data. And that's called reconciliation. So um, to use different types of data to determine the evolution, you actually have to reconcile all the data. Um, otherwise, you can't run the tree. And so what I've been working on from an evolutionary perspective is to work out the direction of the evolution in these turtles. And that's how that all evolved. Once you've got your tree worked out, you can go into another area, which is called zoogeography. Um, now, this is another species I named, by the way, this is Caledonia cani, and they are quite spectacular. But um, so just looking at the side neck turtles, which are my specialty, um, I'll use them as the example. Now, they're distributed like this. And if you look at a map that most people see of the world, um, any projection of the world map flattened out like you usually see it, they occur in Australia and South America and nowhere else. You know, how did they connect? How did they get one to the other is the question. Um, obviously, at some point they were connected. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in those two continents. But Australia and South America. Australia and South America were never connected in any direct way. So you've got to look at the world at a different angle if you're going to do some zoogeography. Um, and the best way to look at the world when you're dealing with a group such as um, the Keelids, which are what are known as a Gondwanan turtle, um, is to center the world on Antarctica and look at the world from that point of view. Um, and as you notice, South America and Australia via Antarctica are actually not that far apart. So if we just put the distribution on of the keelids, the modern distribution, um, they're still found in Australia and parts of Indonesia and South America, as the other map showed. Now we add some fossils that are known and a couple that are probable. And We've got fossils right down to the tip of South America and in right down to the bottom tip of Australia. There are no longer any turtles in those two areas because it's too cold, but they were there in the past. There's also fossils in Antarctica of turtles. Antarctica used to be covered in forests and um, it had dinosaurs. It had um, many species of animals living there that went extinct when Antarctica froze. Now, let's look at it in the past. The world didn't always look like it does now. It moves constantly. All the plates of the Earth move. So we rearranged the Earth to how it looked about 105 million years ago. And Australia is still connected to Antarctica. And South America is still connected to Antarctica. And it looks like the Chelidae, the side neck turtles, split off from the Arara Pemidae in South America about 135 million years ago. And they spread. Um, and they went through Antarctica and then they got up to Australia. <clears throat> and it looks like the oldest fossils in Australia are 103 million years ago. Um, 103 but um, it is possible there's older, but that's the youngest um, age on them. What we have in aging is a, what we call a hard minimum and an approximate maximum age. 
because when you find a fossil and you can date the the bed that the fossil was found in, the rock layer, that tells you that the animal's there at, at, at that time. But it could have been there before it as well, but you don't know that. So this is the minimum age, not the max. And so it looks like the keelids just traveled across, south, down from South America, across Antarctica and into Australia, and everything was connected back then. These turtles cannot travel by sea. Um, the keelids um, cannot handle salt water, they're salt intolerant. So the only way to travel is by land. Um, okay. And so when you look at the molecular data, and this is a little bit of an old tree, it's got some of the older names on it still, but the point is that you've got this whole group of turtles at the top in the yellow, which are Australian, and another group of turtles in the bottom, which are South American. It includes long necks and short necks on both sides. And the gap that separates them is very old. And that is what is meant by reciprocal monophyly. All of the Australian turtles are more related to each other than they are to anything in South America. All the ones in South America are more related to each other than they are to anything in Australia. But they are sister groups. So that's reciprocal monophyly. And um, it's another evolutionary um, research area that we look at, finding things that have this monophyly because it's very important to work out evolutionary pathways. Okay, and in case anyone's wondering, yeah, I study turtles because they're cute. <laughs> and um, that's what I've always loved doing. So, yeah, I'm happy to answer lots of questions if people have them. <laughs> that's great. And, and, you know, one of the things I did, I have quite a few students in here, is we did um, phylogenetic trees and they had to play around with the characters and figure out what was most related to what. We talked about a clade, um, what a clade means. And so I'm gonna start with this question from Barnett. Um, in taxonomy, have there been discoveries that require expansive revisions in classification of species and or taxonomic groups in recent history? I, I suppose you just explained one, the fact that the long neck turtles should be at the base of the tree. So that was a big revision. Yeah, they, it happens fairly frequently, honestly. Um, it depends on how big a group you're meaning. Um, I mean, at the phylum level, not so often, um, but as you work down the trees through class, order, etc., cetera, um, it becomes more and more common. And of course, we've had a massive shakeup in the relationship of birds. And um, I mean, birds are basically reptiles and they're related to um, crocodiles and um, to a lesser degree, possibly turtles. I'm not sure with the turtles. Uh, that goes back and forth. But that whole um, section of how we classify animals is in a state of flux and has been for quite a few years. Um, it's generally accepted now that birds are within the, what used to be called the reptilia. And, right. um, but um, the... Um, relationship of mammals to um, the rest of the groups has also been questioned at times. Um, and certainly the, the relationship of turtles to um, other reptiles has always been difficult because by the time you go back far enough to, um, you know, the ancestor of turtles, it doesn't have a shell. So it's a bit hard to clearly show that that is an ancestor of a turtle when it doesn't have any of the features of a modern turtle. Um, so it, it's a very difficult one to um, establish, but there are, they are getting there. Um, but yeah, they get shaken up all the time, especially in the invertebrates. The invertebrates get thrown around all the time. Mm -hmm. there, there's always shakeups. Um, what specific trait makes turtles I suppose it's trait or traits makes turtles so successful being able to survive, you know, where so many other species went extinct. Well, first up, the ones that survived were probably small. Um, when I say turtles survived, I mean turtles as a group. It doesn't mean they all survived the species. A lot of them possibly went extinct. But um, the turtles in general, they have very slow metabolisms, which is very helpful if most of the world's food 
crashes because an, an asteroid is hit or something. Um, they can go a very long time without food. Um, I mean, the turtles and tortoises collected by the whalers would be sat on ships for up to a year without being fed or given any water. So they can go an extremely long time without food. They lay eggs, which helps, um, um, less investment. And um, generally, they're, they're actually quite tough animals. And um, they have armor, which helps. They have um, a thick reptilian skin, which would help. Um, so they have a slower interaction with the environment. It doesn't mean they can't go extinct. It just means that as a group, they have survivability. Um, what are the main differences that distinguish sea turtles from land turtles? Um, apart from the flippers, <laughs> um, there, although there is a freshwater turtle with flippers, a turtle called Caratocales, um, sea turtles for the most part, with the ex or modern ones, um, all belong to a single family, the Colonia Day. And um, they have salt glands under the eyes, they have um, unique features of the skull and um, scalation of the head, they have flippers, modified front feet to um, use for swimming. And um, their locomotion method is um, not a walking style. They're, they, When they move their legs, they're moving them in synch um, synchronized. So both move at the same time, so they're sort of flying through the water. Um, and this goes for the leatherback as well, which is in a different family, but it's um, many of those features as well. And um, none of the freshwater turtles have uh, that combination of features. Totally different. There's a good question. Um, have we found transition fossils where the rib cage is gradually gradually moving outside of the pelvis, and it's visible as it's moving in a different spot? Um, there are fossils that people believe are ancient turtles um, that have the plates developing. Um, you know, Thesaurus, for example, which was the first one on that um, poster I showed, um, but the pelvis moving, not so much that I've seen any fossils that show that as a transition. Um, it's likely that turtles developed their carapace and plastron in stages. And at, in some of the early stages, they um, had the pelvis still outside the range of the, of the carapace. Um, it's not um, likely that they developed it all at once. In embryology, when you look at embryo turtles, the very, very early stages of the embryos do still have the pelvis outside like any other vertebrate, but they move it as they're developing. Ah, interesting. Evo Devo. Um, so this one's a more personal question. Um, tell us about your first time in the field with turtles. Is it What, what was your inspiration to get into this biologist's career? Um, all right. I'll have to answer that as a two-part question because it's slightly different. Okay, um, the thing that got me interested in turtles was way back when I was a child. I mean, I was very young and I was bought a book about the Galapagos and um, it, it was a kid's book. It wasn't any a young child's book. I was only six. Um, but it showed pictures of different tortoises from different islands and that they were different. And I found that quite, quite fascinating. Um, that a group of um, animals that just lived on a bunch of islands and each island would have its own form. I found interesting and that stuck with me. Um, I started keeping turtles when I was about nine and um, went into zoo industry eventually and I was working on Galapagos tortoises and then finally became a biologist. I didn't go straight from high school into university. I started university when I was 26. First time in the field, um, working on turtles, um, probably when I was an undergrad. Um, oh, it's, it's great work. You know, you get to jump in the mud and catch turtles. Who couldn't want yeah. to do that? <laughs> you don't have to grow up. Just be you honest. You get to jump in the mud and catch turtles. Absolutely. Yeah. It's good um, Question, the new Elsea species being described by yourself, from the, is it from the Daintree region of Queensland? 
Uh, who asked? Queens, Queensland. That is the American in me, I'm assuming that's Queensland, Australia. Yeah, um, that one I was looking at at the time with, um, um, yeah, at the Queensland Museum. Yeah, that's the one from the Daintree that we were looking at. Yes. Okay. Um, can we use recent fossil history and conservation? For example, P. Umbrina, their historical past was surely not from the muddy pools of Western Australia. Should we be looking to re redistribute for the purpose of conservation, or are there many pro too many problems involved with that? I actually think they should, and I've said that to several of the people working on the conservation of um, Sudamadura, um, the one they brought up. Sudamadura and Bryna is a turtle found only in southwest western australia and in 1969 there are only 30 of them left alive um, they're almost extinct um, there's a lot more of them now um, there's been a very successful captive breeding program there's about 600 of them alive now but um the thing with that species is um when when i've been looking at turtles throughout australia and their distributions the zoo geography of them most turtles stay to the east um, but there's fossils of Pseudemadura and Bryna, or well, Pseudemadura, the same genus, not the same species, in Riversley, the same place where the Lavracorum was found, which means that the species used to occur in North Queensland, which is on the opposite side of Australia, uh, some 6,000 kilometres away from um, southwest, Western Australia. So what I think has happened with that species over time is that as Australia has been moving north, and Australia moves north at about three centimetres per year, um, the species has been moving south to compensate for that. So as it stayed in a similar bioclime all the way. But what I think has basically happened to that turtle is it ran out of Australia. It's now found in the southwest corner of Australia almost. It's in... I don't think it's in its most favoured habitat. Um, it's living on the edge of um, what it can cope with. And I don't think that humans had much to do with it going ex um, almost extinct. Um, we, we probably were the final nail in the coffin when we developed Perth and did a lot of damage to its what was left of what habitat it could use. But I think that species didn't do very well in that habitat before humans got there. They were just surviving barely um, and I think it's actual habitat preferred habitat is a slightly different one um, slightly wetter more it's still a fairly dry grassland type swamp um, habitat which is what it lives in but wetter than what it is now and um, I think that's literally it just ran out of Australia it the, the continent moved out from under it effectively and it's um <laughs> it's just got nowhere else to go now and so finding slightly better habitats using the fossil history of the turtle to show where it used to live might actually help that species and there are other species that are possibly in the same boat mm -hmm. um this question's from a very very big dinosaur fan um, <laughs> how do turtles fit into the general reptilia tree um, what general groups are they most related to? How have they, for the most part, collectively changed as a family throughout their time on Earth? I think he they're, just wants to talk about dinosaurs, but, you know. They're basically a member of a group called the Archelosauria, and um, they, at the moment, that could change, because honestly, with turtles, it changes a lot. Their, their absolute root of where they come from, the base of the tree, is debatable and is questioned a lot. Um, it's even considered sometimes they're related to um, lizards and snakes by some people. But um, yeah, the dinosaurs are related clearly to the birds. Honestly, to me, modern birds are dinosaurs. They didn't go extinct, they evolved. Um, chickens are dinosaurs, all right? Um, but um, I mean, and the turtles are somewhere in that area as well of the tree. And then you've got lizards and snakes, which are the squamates, they're called. Um, they're related to a, um, a few other groups and they're off to another section of the tree. And the crocodiles are related to the um, birds and um, turtles, that, depending on which literature you look at, because it changes a lot all the time. 
Okay. Um, so we've sort of refound this fossil. You found the E. labracorum. Are there morphological differences, though, between the ancient fossils and the living species? There were some. Um, the, the fossil seems to have grown to a bigger size than the modern form. Um, now, size is not a, a good character in turtles. Um, they adapt to their environment. And um, so you get, even now, species um, that in one river are very large and in the next river down they're very small. And that's just basically the turtles adapting to the um, productivity of the environment they're in. Um, so as Australia has changed over time, um, Lavracorum has got smaller. So, but it's still morphologically the same species because the two things that are not characters, you can't really use as characters in turtles is size and color. Um, cause they're not linked to any, um, evolutionary process. Um, but yeah, they're, they're slightly different, but they're not, um, different enough. Mm -hmm. Well, that was, I went through the questions here. Um, I think I hit the big ones and we are running out of time. If anybody has a question, now's the time to ask, but, um, we'll wait a few more seconds to see if another question pops up, but that was great. I know I learned a few things. Um, I love the fossil, the, the, the turtle you held up for us to see. And how yeah, I just a skeleton, but, um, and um, it's a modern turtle. It's a Caledina found in Western Australia. Very good. Very good. Um, well, uh, thank you. We've got a few thank yous coming in the comment section for you. Oh, now more and more. And I think that was a very informative presentation to Sharon. Thank you. This was nice as Valeria. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I love helping students, teachers, people around the world interact with scientists. I love how you brought up that you use data, things are always changing, more data comes in, it's a collaborative effort. You really highlighted a lot of what I try to teach in my classroom, what, you know, what makes up scientific work. So that yeah, it's, was it's, uh, And, you know, the one thing that you can guarantee is things change and you've got to just work with it. Right. And, and produce new data and the new data may come up with a different result you have to keep going and that's right. just some be open-minded that's the main thing about teaching science so yes. thank you so much dr thompson and uh if i ever head up towards orlando i think i'll i want to see some of these yeah if people are in orlando they're welcome to come to the cri um we just ask that people um email or call ahead so that we make sure we're going to be here um at the time but um People are welcome to come here for a tour and have a look. Not sure if you want to answer this question real quick at the end. I'm getting a, uh, well, I guess this is kind of a funny question, but have you ever eaten a turtle? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, I had to once. Um, I was in New Guinea and I was trying to negotiate um, an option to get onto some private land to actually look at a um, some turtles and, the chief of the um, tribe where I was negotiating offered me dinner and he, he had turtle on the menu. And, you know, it wasn't one of those moments where you offend the chief, so I ate the turtle. <laughs> <laughs> so even your friends, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not something I would go out of my way to ever eat again. Um, I certainly wouldn't, but there was a circumstantial thing. But, I mean, people do eat turtles all over the world. It, it happens. Um, as long as it's not causing any issues for the species in question, um, people do have to eat. Yes, of course. Of course, I agree. Okay, well, thank you for taking that last question real no, quick. And everybody, this will be also available as a recording on my Crowdcast page, and I will share that on the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science uh, Facebook page, our web page, and um, the Edbodo. So, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Not a problem. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao.